Have you ever had fitness questions that just simply don't make sense and probably sound moronic, so you just don't ask them anyways? Well, that's really good, because what I'm going to try to do in this video is go through Reddit on some of the most moronic questions about fitness that I've ever seen, answer them, and hopefully give you some conclusions about the questions you never wanted to answer in the first place. And at worst, if you watch this video, hopefully you can get some comedy out of it. I don't know. I guess you're going to be the judge of that. And let me know in the comments below. Let us go through the old Reddit machine and see what kind of crazy questions we can get today about fitness. Serious Fish 1886 asks, if muscle sits under fat, would having more muscle on your frame spread out the fat thinner and make you look leaner? Well, not really, unfortunately. While there definitely can be something to be said about especially abdominal muscles being pushed out and then creating shapes on your abdominal wall, it's not necessarily going to happen. Let's say you have a really thick waist by nature because you've built a ton of muscle doing hard labor or some other shit and now you've gotten a lot of fat as well well your waist is going to have that layer of muscle and then also the layer of fat so your layer of thickness conglomerately will just be larger no good we don't want that shit so i always tell people if you think that you don't have muscle the best proxy to understand if you do or don't have muscle is to lose a lot of fat and then get extremely lean the thing about this is that a lot of times people who are fat think they are big and muscular and people who are skinny not muscular think they are fat, but they are muscular when they lose fat. I know that didn't really make sense, but you get where I'm going with it. Basically, people's perception of themselves is very inaccurate. And most of the time, if you just build muscle under fat, which is very hard to do, you will just look fatter. It's pretty crazy. I don't know if you've ever seen like strongman competitors. Those guys have huge bellies. It's not because they have a big beer belly. It's because they have a huge abdominal wall from all that intra abdominal pressure and them eating 10,000 calories a day. Metro BR asks, are lateral raises truly the go mid-delt exercise? Well, yes, they kind of are. Of course, there's a lot of different ones to do. You got cables, you have dumbbells, you can do Y lateral raises, which is something I really prefer if you especially have one of those like V-shaped cable machines that sit in a corner of a gym somewhere that collect dust and no one does anything with them. I think those are great. But specifically for the medial delt, there is really nothing much better outside of some form of a lateral raise. And there's like numerous forms of a lateral raise. I think front raises have their own benefits for some people who struggle to connect with lateral raises, but those are still a little bit like, and when I say like front raises, I mean, I'm pretty sure they're called like front rows. I don't actually do them front lateral row. I don't know. The one where you lift the bar like this, you know what I'm talking about? You just go like that and you get bigger delts, uh, or at least you hope. But if you're like me, you just chronically stay small for the rest of your life, even on grams of steroids and you never get to your dreams. Flat statistician, statistician, 43. How many weeks of not progressing reps or weight is plateau? Oh, very, very good question, actually. I don't really think it's that moronic, but I guess you could think it as a moronic question because it's kind of self-answering. Critical thinking goes so far. It goes really, really far. It really does. Just sit down by yourself, no phone, no devices, and just think about your problems. And almost always, you'll be surprised to find that you can come up with your own solutions. It's kind of a crazy thing that the human mind can do. Self-contemplation, introspective thinking, those kind of things. It really works well. Just try it sometimes, okay, guys? But how many weeks of not progressing reps or weight is a plateau. I would usually say, depending on the person and depending on how many calories they're consuming, let's just say they're in a hypercaloric state, so they're eating an abundance of calories trying to put on mass, I would say that anything beyond three weeks is a bit concerning. Usually, depending on the frequency of your split, you can have stalls for three weeks. It really wouldn't be that surprising. I myself am trying to get to four plates on the bench. I'm at three plates and a 35 pound plate. Uh, and for those of you Nazis out there, I think that's like 15 kgs. It is 15 kgs. I'm just acting stupid. But the idea there is I've been doing that for like three fucking weeks, right? But the thing I've noticed is that I am progressing in the ease of doing that movement. Now, it doesn't mean that the movement itself is better, like I'm not getting more reps and I'm not getting more weight, but the control and ability to train that movement with stability at that given weight is much better. And so sometimes those architectural changes and specifically the neurological changes take a lot of time to happen. I often find that people sometimes shortchange themselves and they say, I'm not progressing, I'm not progressing. And it's been a week, it may be two, like it, it's not enough. Your body does require time. And other things can be huge variable impacts as well. Sleep, water intake, food intake, salt intake, the position of the fucking moon. And that sounds crazy as shit, but it's actually a real thing because depending on where the moon is, weights way less or way more. So all these things correlate. But if you average out over a three week span, it'd be really hard to say that if you weren't progressing, 
something on average, you know, th then I would say that we should wait longer. No, I think you would at that point be able to say I'm plateauing. And then the solution would be increasing calories. If you're using drugs, increasing drugs, or if you are too fat, losing weight, doing a deload, and then starting back up again. Laker fan asks, when I'm doing strict curls, I'm assuming biceps, I accidentally hit my forearms as well as my biceps. Am I doing something wrong? Well, no, I, I think a lot of people really mess this up. The bicep is in part attached to the forearm. And so there's actually a form of a bicep curl where you curl your arm and then you bring your, sh you actually articulate your shoulder to bring this up a little bit, to just get a little bit more hyperextension. And that trains the brachialis, which is part of your bicep, but it's on your forearm. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And a lot of people think it's a bad thing and want to deactivate their forearms, but I don't want small forearms. I know you probably don't want small forearms. So I, I don't mind the extra volume on the forearms. Now, if it's inhibiting the ability to hold the bar, that's another problem, which is more correlative to grip strength, I think, as opposed to just having, you know, fatigued uh, one singular muscle in your forearm when there's truly hundreds. So I would say this is quite normal. I feel it generally, uh, certainly with more movements versus others. And when I see people say strict curls, I often question what that strict curl looks like. What people tend to think as strict curls, in my view of the general fitness population, is it's the kind of curl where you're sort of having your arm at a, a forward slant and you're doing it like this. It's usually on one of those machines like the preacher curls or they're putting it on their knee or some crazy shit like this. I actually like to do it the exact opposite where your arm is either straight down. So using the preacher curl machine, which is usually angled, but flipping your body around. So you're on the other side of the preacher machine and then you have that straight down angle, much more favorable in my opinion for range of motion and training the length and portion of the bicep. And then also switching around and doing something like a, for example, facing away bicep curl. I think this is a beautiful way to train the length and portion of the bicep and then also not really get your forearm involved because you're not holding the weight out in front of you. It's behind you. This is just my personal anecdotal advice. I have tiny fucking arms, so I obviously don't know what I'm talking about, right? Here's an interesting question. Maybe the wrong day for moronic questions, but maybe someone can answer this question and point me in the right direction. When I train legs, my legs are sore for like three days, so much so that I neatly can't walk. While when I train upper body, I only experience mild discomfort for a few days. A few and three is actually the same thing. So just letting you guys know. I'm a very new person in the fitness world. Before this, I used to be a runner. So my theories are that my leg muscles are more developed so I can hit them harder than my upper body muscles. But that is refuted by the fact that my squat is only 90 pounds uh, and my leg press, Jesus, my leg press is only 270 pounds. Also knees to my ears, proper form. That doesn't sound good. Knees to your ears on the leg press. How do you even functionally do that? That. Okay. Uh, so I'm not that strong. Th it should get, be a recovery. Okay. Quite frankly, uh, actually this comment just literally says what I'm about to say. Quite frankly, running does not develop your legs. It might give you definition, but it doesn't develop your legs. You're not going to get any sort of muscular growth uh, independently from running. But what you will experience while training is a great degree of soreness because for one, the leg muscles are much larger in proportion compared to virtually every other muscle in your body. When you train chest, yeah, it's a big muscle, but it's only like a small small circle if you really think about it your legs are from your knees up to your glutes and lower back like that's a, and up to the front of your hips like your pelvis bone it's a huge muscle and you're training all of that in one day oftentimes i also find too that people without even realizing it will always train legs much harder than they train upper body because generally upper body seems easier it's easier to pitch you know it's like i do a couple pressing movements but on leg day there's this unique thing that happens when you put a bunch of weight on your back and you feel like a fucking god of war and you're just throwing that shit around like a toddler in a playpen. Go! <laughs> you want to lift that shit for whatever reason. Like that's where the ego comes out on leg days. And so people often uh, supersede the amount of loads they need to be doing or supersede the amount of reps or sets they need to be doing. That's a huge problem I often see with people who are training um, without much programming involved. And I would also add to this, if you're sore for more than about 72 hours, as far as we know from exercise science, that is kind of the gray area in terms of like hitting that catabolic wall where you can rest assured you're probably losing more muscle than you are gaining it at that point because 
there's more catabolism happening to clear out all that dead muscle than there is anabolism. So what we would really want in this case is for this individual to either lower volume or lower intensity. I'm much more preferred towards the first one, which is lowering volume and then training legs and seeing how fast he can recover. The other thing is obviously dietary intake is a massive problem and people mostly are fat as fuck. Account 552. How do you cope with being below average at just about everything? Um, you don't. You stay in perpetual suffering, trying to be better than everybody around you, but realizing the tangible aspect of being better than everyone around you is just completely unfeasible. And your best bet is to just lay down and never get up. I do that almost every day, but I somehow get up. So it works for me. It might work for you. Allegedly. Don't do that at home. Homeless anal bead. Asks, this is probably a dumb question, but I've gotten into the gym about two months ago and trying to lose some weight. I've been lifting as well, and since muscle mass increases BMR, now with that said, I've been paying much more attention to my muscles. What I've noticed for my weight and how unfit I am, my calves are absolutely shredded. When I get them pumped, they look like movie star quality calves. I'm guessing that is from having... <laughs> to lift my fat ass every time I walk, but nonetheless, I found it interesting. I'm also think I'm gaining mass in my legs faster because that's all I ever trained as a kid, skateboard mostly. Yeah, I mean, mostly you gotta think every step you take is a rep. And if your body weight is twice that of a normal, you know, body mass index, you're gonna be lifting a lot more weight poundage per day. You usually see this in guys who are naturally heavy, their calves are pretty fucking ridiculous. Uh, the other thing that can be said about that too is, is most men don't really hold fat in their calves unless you're really obese men can pretty much isolate fat gain to their like abdomen and like glutes and lower back where women are more you know prone to having that sort of lower leg fats stomach hip fat more so than stomach and then like upper chest fat stuff i don't want to talk about all this just leave it alone but yeah you're jacked because you're fat hmm. All right, this one's a bit controversial. Why is the consensus on this sub that where you feel a lift doesn't matter? Like lots of people saying something like, I think I'm doing deadlifts wrong because I don't feel it in my glutes. And the common answer is you're using your glutes. What you feel doesn't matter, etc., etc., etc. He's asking, why would that be such a thing? Now, we know for sure that feeling isn't necessarily the most predictive thing to say that you're growing muscle or building a bunch of tissue, but that doesn't mean that it's not a valuable metric. You can feel tension. You can feel mechanical stress on a muscle. We have mechanoreceptors on our muscle cells for that exact reason. Imagine that. And nervous cells. So we definitely feel tension. Like if I stretch my arm, I feel my bicep pulling. If I go like this, I feel my tricep extending. Those things are very indicating to me that I am training that movement in a correct pattern and I'm getting a full stretch and I'm getting a full contraction. I think if you'd ask any bodybuilder ever in the history of all time, they would tell you that you need to be able to feel the muscle you're training. Having a neurological ability to understand how to move that muscle through a range of motion is absolutely critical. Now, a lot of people on this sub are answering this with, it doesn't really matter. I think they're kind of dweebs with no, like they have glasses bigger than their fucking arms. Okay. So let's be honest. Anyone who's trained for a reasonable amount of time, and this is not a hot take at all. Like this is just the fucking facts. If you don't feel the muscle you're training, if you're not getting a wild pump from the muscle you're training, you're likely not targeting that muscle effectively through erroneous technique or just simply improper loading. That is a very commonplace thing with people beginning. So I don't necessarily buy the whole, well, it doesn't matter if you don't feel it because having a neurological connection with where tension is, is critical in a huge function as to why uh, bodybuilders can get so big. I think I've talked about this and many other bodybuilders have talked about this, but the reason that we take Anovar, which is a performance enhancing drug, it's because of its unique property to stimulate motor learning. And when you train with Anovar, you can feel the muscles specifically so much better. And in response to that feeling, you can then get a greater pump, you have more strength. And as a subsequent result, you'll notice that that movement in isolation was better than it's ever been. Even when compared to other drugs that bodybuilders would take, it's a very unique effect of Anovar. And the thing about it is that you retain that memory of how to activate that muscle and what it felt like after the workout. Critical function to build a copious amount of muscle, something that I think most people would benefit from. Most, not all, but pretty 
pretty much all. <laughs> pretty much all. I'm not even gonna, like, this is crazy to me. The amount of people were like, no, it doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. I think it is one of the functions of the human body that we can thankfully rely on to at least a good proxy of something that means the workout is working. If you don't feel something, likely you're not training something, okay? This is just full stop what I think. But let me know what you think in the comments below. What do you think? Am I wrong? Am I just an asshat with red hair and uh, a mustache at this point because you guys asked for it? I don't know. But what I do know is that if you liked, commented, and even subscribed, which would be insanely helpful and it's completely free to you, it would push my al algorithm chances or the demigods of YouTube to push me into the, the algorithm or however this stuff works um, so that more people could view. More people could view and we could become a strong community. Very tough, tough community. Super tough. Uh, so I'm going to get my chicken out of the, the oven because I think it's burning. I hope you have a good day.